good morning. Um, I'm supposed to have a talk here. Um, do we have any PowerPoint? <laughs> okay, um, well, I'm gonna just ramble for a few minutes while hopefully someone is setting up the PowerPoint, um, which I've been asking about all morning. Anyway, so I'm just gonna start by saying how fantastic it is to be here. I've spoken at many um, book events, but many physics events, um, but this one definitely is a different sort of event, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, I know it's a literature festival, so I was gonna start by just talking about, um, just for a couple of minutes, why I wrote this book, hopefully um, anticipating some slides that will appear <laughs> very soon. Okay, good. Okay, so, um, so the book is called Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, but it actually has an important subtitle, um, which is The Astounding Interconnectedness of the Universe. So let me just first begin by telling you who I am. So I'm professor of theoretical physics. Um, my domain has been elementary particle physics. That is to say, what is at the root of matter? Um, you know, we look around today, we see the world as it is, but what lies inside that? What do we see when we study it more intently? What do we see when we look at big accelerators, when we get inside to the domain? And I wrote some books about that. Um, I wrote books about even an extra dimension of space, um, which would be help explain some of the properties of matter. But in the process, of, and, and why did I write those books? Well, I wanted to explain some of these ideas, which it's really hard to do justice to if you just have an, one little newspaper article. I want to explain what kind of questions we're asking, why we're asking them, and explain in a, in a somewhat different way. Um, but the amazing thing is that one of the hardest things to explain are things that are being discovered today, like the Higgs boson, how particles acquire their masses. Um, and then I moved research fields somewhat, so I'm working more now on cosmology um, and dark matter in particular, which I'll tell you about as soon as the slides are up, I promise. Um, okay, there we go. Um, and so in the process of doing that, it became very exciting to realize that even though we're looking at these very tiny, seemingly remote um, elements of matter, how essential they are to the universe as we see it today. And understanding those connections seemed to me extremely important. So although I'm talking about my particular research in this book on dark matter and an extinction, really what I'm interested in is a book that tied together um, how the universe has come to evolve, how the galaxy has come to evolve, how the solar system and even life on Earth. And to sort of put that in one book so we can see that these things are not just independent remote fields of science, but in fact, they're all connected. So as I said, the motivation for this work was in part to connect these abstract, seemingly abstract ideas. As I said, I've talked, I've written several other books, and, and what strikes me is that although these things are very real, they're real on scales that we don't directly observe, which makes them seem so abstract for some people, but in fact, they're real, and that's, those connections were why I wanted to get across. The other thing I want to get across in this book um, is just the history of life on the planet. Um, you know, it's funny, I was talking to my friends who are historians who are here as well, and they were talking about how when we approach policy, we don't, think, we don't look into the history before to really understand what we're doing. And in some sense, in a very grander sense in a way, the same is true of science. We're changing the face of the planet in ways that are really important and at an incredibly rapid rate right now. Yet, we don't think about the billions of years of history of the evolution of, our, so, uh, of the universe and you know, the thousands of years of evolution of life, the millions of years of evolution of planets, et cetera. So, and billions of years. So, so I thought it was really important to put all of this into the context that I'm going to tell you about. But having said that, I'm gonna to turn to actual science for some of this talk. So I hope you're all interested in learning more about cosmology and the planet. But before I begin, I just wanna do wanna add this one thing, which for me was amazing, because for me, I do particle physics and cosmology. But in the process of writing this book, I tied it together with paleontology, geology, um, astrophysics, obviously. So it was really, a, 
an amazing thing for me to learn so much about the amazing connections that go into where we are today. And I tried to convey a lot of them. I won't have time to do them all here, but, but really to think about how so much is tied together. Um, where carbon comes from, stars that come into our planet that create a, a, a cycle that then allows life on, carbon based life on Earth to evolve. So there were many fields of science and there was a sense of awe and wonder. But the important other things that I'll get to later are the importance of the rate of change in determining how science works and in particular how quickly things are changing today. But let me just turn to science now and we can come back to these themes in the questions. So this is known as the cosmic pie, this, this picture you see here. And it's a chart that tells us the distribution of energy in our universe. And it's quite a remarkable chart. So this is done in the shape of a pie. I don't know how well you can see it. But that thin white sliver represents stuff that's like us, ordinary matter. So this is telling the percentage of energy carried by various components in the universe. And only 5% is matter that we're aware of. The other two components are things that we're still trying to figure out what they are. We know they're there, namely some things that are called dark matter and dark energy. And we know they're there because we can observe their gravitational influences. However, that's all we observe. We don't observe directly what they are. We don't literally see them. The reason we don't see them is because of this thing that they're dark. That is to say, they do not interact with light. They're not made up of the same stuff of ordinary matter. They're not made up of atoms and ordinary material. It's really new stuff that's out there. And that new stuff we call either dark matter or dark energy. It's a bad name. You do see dark things. My shirt is fairly dark and you see it because it absorbs light. Really, dark matter is transparent matter. It's matter because it interacts gravitationally like matter. It clumps into galaxies, for example, like the one we live in. But it's not ordinary matter because it doesn't interact with light the same way. It's not made up of the same stuff. The rest of it, which I'm going to talk even less about, is called dark energy. Dark energy is in some way more mysterious and some way less mysterious than ordinary matter. It's energy that is not carried by matter. It's just energy that's out there. If you need to think of an analogy, you might think about a magnetic field. You have a field even if you don't have an actual object there. In the same way, you can have this energy even where there's no matter, and that energy we know it's there because it's responsible for the acceleration of the expansion of our universe. It has quite a dramatic effect. As does dark matter. Dark matter is matter that interacts via gravity, but as far as we know so far, it doesn't interact in other ways. That makes it really hard to study directly because gravity despite the fact that it seems so important to us, is a very weak force. The reason gravity seems so important to us is that we have the entire Earth pulling us down. If we had individual particles, the force of gravity would be like 40 orders of magnitude weaker than the force of, say, electromagnetism. That's 10 multiplied by itself 40 times. It's negligible. So when we do research studying dark matter, we have to really think about how we can see it. Now, why can we see it? Well, remember in that cosmic pie I just showed you? There's a lot of it. There's five times the amount of dark matter as ordinary matter, which makes it a really good research field because we know it's there. We know there's a lot of it, but we don't know what it is yet. Now, you might think, why do we care about this dark matter? It turns out, had there not been dark matter, the structure that we see, our whole structure that our whole life is built upon would not have existed today. Without dark matter, without this enormous amount of matter pulling together, bringing in ordinary matter, we wouldn't have had enough time to develop galaxies and structure in the universe. Not only that, 
But the fact that dark matter doesn't interact with light was essential to what we see because radiation would have washed out structure on the scale of a galaxy. So dark matter basically was what clumped together to form everything we see in the sky and ordinary matter came along, which is why we can actually see it. Now, that makes dark matter quite important and in fact dark matter is responsible for keeping stars rotating in our galaxy today. Without dark matter, at the speed that stars go, they would fly out of the galaxy. Um, so dark matter is really an essential component of our universe. There are probably billions of dark matter particles passing through every second. This isn't some isolated thing that's far off somewhere else. It's right here. Now you might ask, why don't you know about it? It's precisely because it interacts so weakly. So we know this stuff is there. We know it formed a vital part in forming our universe, yet we don't know what it is. So I'm gonna tell you today a little bit about our research into trying to find out what it is. But as importantly, I want you to think about how this stuff all fits together in the creation of our universe. Because it's a, really quite an amazing story. So this is a little fancy kind of plot but it shows you one of the more immediate ways we kind of see dark matter. As I said, we don't literally see it, but you see that thing on the right that's labeled object? That could be like a star or a galaxy, something that we do see. What dark matter does is through its influence, gravitational influence, it bends light. So light actually bends around the dark matter. And so when you look back in the sky, you see blurry images, or you see multiple images. So you don't directly see the dark matter, but you see its influence. You see exactly where it is through effects like this. And not only that, but we really see it in the sense that this is something known as the bullet cluster. Clusters of galaxies are gravitationally bound sets of galaxies. When they merge, the gas gets stuck in the middle but dark matter passes right through. And what's so important about this is that is exactly what you would expect matter to do. The reason I say that is many people say, are you sure that there's really this stuff out there we don't see? Is there really dark matter? Maybe you just got your equations wrong. So I have a couple of things to say about that. One is that we know a lot about gravity. It's much more radical to say that we got the equations wrong than to say there's this new form of matter. But the second thing is that there's really no reason this matter shouldn't be there. We tend to, and one of the things that constantly comes up when you're doing physics research, when I'm writing, is how much we get bound up in our human perspective. You know, the Copernican revolution happened a long time ago. We are not the center of the universe, yet, Every time we find it out in a new form, we get upset. And here we're finding out that we're not even all the matter of the universe. In fact, I personally find it remarkable that we are as much of the matter of the universe as we are. We have 5% of the energy of the universe. That is an incredible thing. And the fact that the amount of dark matter is so similar to the amount of ordinary matter, yes, there's more of it, but there could have been a billion times more of it or a billion times less of it. The fact that they're so similar, I find a fascinating aspect of our universe today. So the really remarkable thing is not that dark matter exists, but that it exists in an amount that's comparable to the amount of ordinary matter, so that their interplay is so essential to what we see today. So I hope in this small amount of time, I've convinced you that dark matter is something that we do know exists. You know, you'll read in the paper all these exotic theories of gravity, but really, we know dark matter is there. And the question we have as researchers is, what is it? And one of the things that I also try to convey in my book is just the fact that science is a, an evolving process. We do know dark matter is there. We do know a lot. We're basing it on real physical theories. We don't know essentially what it is. That is to say, we don't know, is it even particles? We don't know what the mass of those particles are. We don't know, do they have a little bit of interaction? Those are the kinds of things we're trying to find out. So where is dark matter? Well, I told you it's here, but where is it in the context of the galaxy? Well, 
It turns out that our galaxy that we see, um, if you look on a clear, dry night, you can see the Milky Way. How many people have actually seen the Milky Way? Curious. Awesome. I'm not sure where you see it here. So I was just in Delhi, which was way too foggy to see it. But I'm sure there are nice, clear places that you can go to, clear, dry desert, where you can see the bright stars and the bright gas of the Milky Way. But that Milky Way that we see that looks like it's in more or less a plane is surrounded by essentially a spherical halo, what we call a halo of dark matter, a sphere of dark matter that's all around. Now, it's an interesting question. If dark matter and ordinary matter both interact via gravity, why are they distributed so differently? <laughs> um, it turns out that the reason is precisely because ordinary matter interacts. Ordinary matter radiates, and because it radiates, it loses energy. And because it loses energy, it collapses into this disk. That's going to be important for the research I'm going to tell you about. But right now, it's just an explanation for why dark matter just keeps bouncing up and down in the spherical halo, but ordinary matter collapses into a disk. So that's why, even though there's so much more dark matter in the universe, where we live, there's much more ordinary matter. Because ordinary matter is much denser because it's collapsed into this disk. So this is what I said earlier. We know dark matter is there. We don't know what it is. And when we ask what it is, we really want to know its nature in the sense of the way we know other particles. Um, what is it? Is it one particle? Is it many particles? Does it only interact via gravity? Does it, what is its mass? We just, we would like to study it more directly. But we don't yet know, does it have big enough interactions to interact with our matter? Or does it even have big enough interactions with itself that we can identify different properties in galaxies that tell us it's there? And that's the kind of thing we're trying to study. So, and the emphasis of this is to explain that there's a lot of stuff we know. We can look and see some things that are obvious. But it's these less obvious things that are still fundamental. They're still true. And that's what we're trying to get at. We're trying to see how we can get from the connections we see by looking out in the sky to understanding this fundamental nature of the matter that created it. And that's what I do. It's known as model building. We're trying to put together the pieces to see what underlies the amazing universe that we see. That was supposed to not be there. OK. So what is my research about? And what do I want to tell you? And why might there be a connection to an extinction? Well, here's the idea. Suppose that dark matter isn't just in this spherical halo. Suppose dark matter, or at least some of the dark matter, could also radiate. Suppose it could also interact with its own form of light. And this is something amazing to think about because we're so caught up in our universe that we think our light is the only kind there is. But if you, for a moment, think of yourself as a dark matter particle, how do you know that you don't have your own light that our matter doesn't interact with? How do you know that dark matter doesn't carry its own charge we don't observe it because we're not charged under it, just the same way dark matter doesn't see our light. It would be an amazing thing. Maybe some of the dark matter has its own light, and it too can radiate. Why do we think about this? Well, it's a distinct possibility. It's kind of an obvious possibility. Why should dark matter be so simple and boring? I mean, we see it as simple and boring because we don't interact with it that much. But maybe there's a rich universe of dark matter that we don't directly observe. So the question becomes, is there any way we would know about it? And the answer is, yes, we would know about it, because if it has its own interactions, it would change the shape of the universe in ways that we now can observe. So let me just tell you about that for a couple of minutes, because it's really one of the ways that we can get at the stuff that's so mysterious to us, the stuff that we don't directly see. So again, the basic insight is why should dark matter be so simple? 
Again, from a human perspective, we assume that our universe is so rich and complex. In fact, we know our universe is rich and complex. Why do we think dark matter should be so simple? After all, there's a lot more of it. So maybe it too has an interesting structure. And the great thing about that is in that case, dark matter also would form a Milky Way-like disk. Not only the Milky Way disk that we see, but maybe dark matter is also in a disk. And it turns out that that disk could be dense and thin and in the center of the Milky Way. Now, that's a nice speculation, but one of the reasons we do model building is because then we can think about how you can look for this. So how would you look for this? Well, you'd have to look for the gravitational influence. How, what would this gravitational influence be? It would affect the motion of stars. Stars nearby would respond to the fact that there is this extra gravitational pull from dark matter. So if you could measure the position and velocity of many stars in the Milky Way, you can pin it down. And remarkably, we actually have something called the Gaia satellite that the European Space Agency set up. You might not know about it, but it's really a fantastic thing. It is out there in the universe measuring a billion stars in the Milky Way. That's probably about 1% of the stars in the Milky Way, but it's quite a few. And if you can measure a billion stars in the Milky Way accurately, know where they are and how they're moving, you can actually put together quite a bit about what, in some sense, the shape of the galaxy is. So if this dark matter exists, we will know about it within a few years because there's an, there would be an indication in the motion of stars. Now, it might be that it gets measured and we find out that dark matter disk does not exist, or maybe it has less density in it, it's smaller than we thought. But this is why we do science. We're trying to find out what's out there. We don't know what's out there until we actually look. I do theory, I don't do these measurements, but by telling people what to look for, we have a much better chance of finding things. If you are looking for a needle in a haystack, if the Higgs boson that probably some of you, most of you know about, that was like a one in a billion event. The reason people could find this Higgs particle was because they knew what to look for. So when we do model building, we're trying to point out what to look for because as we all know, unless you're looking for something, you rarely find it. You might find random other things, but it really helps to know and that's what we're trying to do as scientists. Tell, tell the observers what would be distinctive, what they could find that could tell us that this dark matter disk existed. But truth in advertising, um, I connected this to the extinction of the dinosaurs, so I'm gonna spend a little bit telling you about the con um, other kinds of connections, the other things we know, not just about dark matter, but about our galaxy and our solar system itself. So, Actually, the solar system is really an amazing thing. It's not what I study personally, but it's amazing how much we've learned about the solar system in the last, say, 50 years. Um, you know, we used to think there were nine planets. Now, to the disappointment of some, Pluto is no longer a planet, and there's eight planets. Now, although people see that as disappointing, it actually was an extremely exciting measurement or measurements that made Pluto not a planet. Because what was discovered was other objects that were similar to Pluto. This is really far away. It's maybe 30 times as far from the sun as the Earth. And it was in something called the Kuiper Belt. So there's the asteroid belt between Venus and Mars, which is basically a bunch of rocks that are rotating around that haven't become planets. And beyond that is something called the Kuiper Belt and the scattered disk, which is the source of long period comets. So it's icy bodies that are out there. It's all really cool stuff. There's icy frozen bodies. They're so far from the sun that they're frozen. But then sometimes their orbit changes and it becomes more elliptical and it gets closer to the sun. And when it gets closer to the sun, you get vapor. And that's why you see these beautiful comet tails that tell you that you had a comet. Now, Short period comets come from other places, but long period comets come from, short period comets come from this Kuiper Belt. 
Those are comets that have a period less than 200 years. So those are ones that come around every, less than every 200 years, the ones we're familiar with. Now, much, much farther away, this is something that's only recently become understood, but much farther away, thousands of times farther away, but in our solar system, so still going around the sun, are objects called the Oort cloud. And those are the source of long period comets, comets that come around more than 200 years. So you, you won't see more than one in your lifetime unless um, people do the promise of letting us live forever. Um, these are things that come around occasionally and come by the Earth. Now, the thing is that if you are thousands of times farther away from the sun than the Earth, the effect of the sun, the gravitational pull, is much smaller. And it's so much smaller that even a small kick, a small force on it, could kick something out of that Oort cloud, or kick it out of the solar system, or kick it so that it's more likely to come to Earth. Now, why do we care about that? Sometimes things actually hit the Earth. Um, this sounded crazy, and this was an amazing story in itself, understanding that there can be things called impact craters. I mean, we know that volcanoes form craters, but these are craters that are formed from objects from the sky that hit the Earth. Um, it sounds kind of crazy. It sounds like a folktale. And in fact, in the beginning, scientists did think it was a folktale. You know, the only people that would see things fall from the sky were basically farmers working out in the fields. And the scientists actually dismissed what they said. They thought it was just another, you know, story. And then eventually, one fell right in front of the Scientific Academy of Siena. At that point, the scientists had to admit that this was real. Um, this one I have a picture of here is a really beautiful example of an impact crater. It's something known as the Meteor or Barringer Crater. And it's named after Daniel Barringer. And his, this story itself, I don't have time to tell you the full story, is really great too. Because there was a debate about this crater. This is in Arizona in the United States. It's not the biggest, but it's one of the best preserved. You can see this beautiful circular structure. And coincidentally, it happens to be near where there's a lot of volcanoes. So there was a big debate about what this was. Now, Daniel Barringer was an engineer and a businessman. Now, they had found some iron, so he thought that whole hole was coming from iron that had filled it up. So he invested heavily in showing that this was, in fact, an impact crater. And he succeeded, in a sense, because he did show that it was an impact crater but because it's not formed by a lot of iron hitting, he lost a lot of money because it was not a lot of iron there. We, at this time, it wasn't understood this, how the structure of impact craters formed. And that I, I talk about in the book. It's a really interesting story how shock waves create this circular structure. But it wasn't understood so he could identify that it was an impact crater, but not which precise one it was or how it was formed. Now, why in human history should we care about impacts? This is a lot of information, but it's really fascinating stuff. So we've had 550 years, 550 million years, billion, million years, sorry, 550 million years of life that could form fossils on Earth, basically. I mean, there's other fossils from before, but sort of the Phanerozoic era is when we really have a very outstanding fossil record. Now, what is a fossil record? It's really the imprint of hard structures like bones and teeth that tell us about what life was here on Earth. Now, there's two different points of view here. You might say, well, any individual form of life is very unlikely to leave an imprint. On the other hand, there's been a lot of life on Earth. So just statistically, people were able to get together and figure out how, a lot of things about the evolution of life. And one of the major things that was discovered is that there have been, and again, this was really radical at the time it was identified, but there have been five major mass extinctions. Now, but what an extinction is, is when not only does the life itself go away, but all descendants of that life form goes away. And what a major mass extinction is, is basically 
two-thirds of the species on the planet disappearing, maybe more. It's a lot of life disappears all at the same time. So, you know, we've been taught to think of evolution, to think of life as a slowly evolving process. But it has certainly been punctuated by these extraordinarily dramatic events where over half, over two-thirds of the species on the planet have disappeared. Now, as you can imagine, that requires some really big phenomena to happen. And of course, people even talk today about an extinction being in the process of happening um, associated with the heating and carbon dioxide and many other changes that we're making to the face of the planet. And in fact, the biggest extinction happened 250 million years ago, and it's associated with excess carbon dioxide. And that was over 90% of the species on the planet disappeared. But the one I'm focusing on now is known as the KPG, or KT extinction. It's the extinction, the last major mass extinction we know about. It happened fairly recently, 66 million years ago. And that's the one that's known for the dinosaurs disappearing. But it wasn't just the dinosaurs that disappeared. It was basically, to, and I should say land-dwelling dinosaurs. Birds are actually evolved from dinosaurs, we believe. But land-dwelling mammals, most of them disappeared, except for very s small ones that existed then. Um, well, mammals all were small, but most of the stuff on the planet disappeared. And we really want to know what caused that. So there's strong evidence that in the geological record, and it's really clear in the geological record, it's an amazing thing. You can look and you can see layers of white limestone where there were many fossils being formed. So those fossil, so the reason that limestone is white is because of the calcium coming from little objects that leave this fossil record. Then you see it stops abruptly. There's a layer of red clay, and above it is gray rock because those species disappeared. And it's not just in one place, it's all over the globe. So there was this very clear evidence in the fossil record that this extinction happened 66 million years ago. And like I said, it's where the dinosaurs disappeared. And why should people care about that? Well, I would say that because the dinosaurs disappeared, it gave rise to mammals being able to take over and become big and get some resources, which eventually led to us. So on the one hand, a lot of stuff disappeared. On the other hand, we owe our very existence to this extinction. But from a scientific point of view, of course, the question is, what caused this extinction? Now, what would be a good clue to what caused it would be how long it took to happen. You have this layer of clay that separates before and after. So if you know something about how long that layer of clay took to form, you could then figure out how long this extinction took, which would be a big clue to what happened. And that was exactly what Walter Alvarez set out to do. And so in basically the 1970s, he and his wife went to Italy. They studied one of these layers, and they wanted to figure out what it was and how long it took. Now, how would they figure it out? Well, fortunately, his father was a physicist and a nuclear physicist. And he suggested looking for an element that is not abundant on the surface of the Earth, but is abundant out in the sky. So what his idea was not to look for big rocks hitting the Earth, but there's actually cosmic dust that hits all the time. So there's stuff falling from the sky. So if you look at the surface of the Earth, the surface of the Earth, many of the heavy elements have come from the fact that things are descending at a constant rate. So he said, look for a rare element. The element he chose was iridium. It's a very hard element found in nibs of fountain pens, for example. He said, measure the amount of iridium in this layer of clay, and from that, we can use it as a cosmic hourglass, the iridium. So we can imagine it descending at a constant rate and figure out how much there is. And that's what he, they set out to do. What they discovered was amazing. They discovered that there was, were 90 times the amount of iridium than would have been expected. So from this, they said something dramatic had to have happened. It wasn't just a simple, slow process. It was actually a rapid, dramatic process. And it turns out, oops, that's the wrong slide. Sorry about that. 
So it turns out that what they had found was the existence of a big impact that had hit the Earth. Now, to really verify that it was a big impact required a lot of additional science. You have to look for all the clues of a big impact, which fortunately or unfortunately are very similar to those of a nuclear bomb, which had been well studied at around that time. So people had done a lot of studies, so they knew what kind of features to look for in rocks. And assuming a nuclear bomb did not happen 66 million years ago, they could verify that there was an impact by looking at all sorts of interesting structures of the rock. But the other thing was, you want to know what time it happened, because you want to really identify that this extinction, which could be measured very precisely because of this extinction record, coincided with something hitting the Earth. The problem was that no one knew what to look for. That is to say, in the beginning, it was supposed to be anywhere on the Earth. How do you find it? So very fortunately, it turned out it was associated with a tidal wave. So they can find tidal evidence in Texas and in Haiti, which narrowed down where it would be. And so then they looked around for stuff there. And they looked over a period of 10 years and didn't find it. So there were some, there's basically at this point about 25 known big impacts. By big, I mean bigger than a kilometer from the last 250 million years. And most of them didn't match. They didn't match. So there was one that was missing at least. Now the story of how they found it is another just unbelievable story. I mean, you know, if it, we, it made it up, you'd think it was ridiculous. But it turns out that in Mexico, there's a company called Pemex, which is an oil company, and they survey the Yucatan because they're looking for oil. And so they, and they've done this for decades. And they had actually, in the process of aerial surveillance, both gravitational and magnetic, identified a circular structure in the Yucatan. Now, unfortunately, it was a company, so the information was proprietorial. It was not made public. Until eventually it was made public in about 1980, which is actually at the time this thing was announced, but it was some small geology meeting and most people weren't in attendance. Remarkably, a decade later, and for those of you who are science journalists in the audience, I think this is just a great story, an inspirational story, but it's an inspirational story for everyone. It was actually a science journalist, Carlos Byers, from the Houston Chronicle, who told the scientists who were looking for this circular structure that he had been at a meeting 10 years earlier where some such structure had been announced. And then they put it together, and that was actually the way this enormous crater, which is now buried under the water in the Yucatan, and has recently been re-excavated, by the way, um, to really study in more detail, was discovered. And then once it was discovered, you could figure out when it happened, you could figure out its size, and everything matched. So unbelievably, I don't know why this, dis why did my slides disappear? Can we put the slides back, please? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, okay, sorry, this is all out of order now. Okay, so this is a list of all the ones that had been discovered, which was important for our research, which I'll come back to in a second. But first I just want to point out the amazing fact that the one that had killed the dinosaurs is actually known. And that's really amazing for many reasons, one of which is that if you think about it, most of these things are gonna disappear because most of the Earth is covered by water. So they're not going to leave craters. The ones that do leave craters over the course of 66 million years, it might not, just might not be a big, big enough structure or a distinctive enough structure, or maybe we built over it. So it was just a remarkable series of coincidences that let this one be discovered. But we now really do know that that happened. So in the, the remaining few minutes, I just want to tie this together with the research that I described earlier and why we might care about it. And the reason is that if there really is this dark matter disk, what would happen? Well, the solar system goes around the galaxy. But as the solar system goes around, it actually bob so the solar system is the sun and all the planets and that Oort cloud. As it does that, it actually bobs up and down a little bit, kind of like horses on a carousel. So every time it went through that dark matter disk, there would be a little bit of an extra kick, a little extra gravitational kick. And remember I told you 
that that kick could actually kick something out of the Oort cloud. So at those times, objects will be more likely to hit the Earth. So the prediction of this kind of theory would be that on a periodic basis, you would actually see additional impacts, additional big impacts. Small impacts happen all the time, believe it or not, from asteroids, et cetera. But big impacts, ones bigger than a kilometer, would be predicted to happen on a periodic basis. And this list that I showed you a minute ago, that is the wrong list, um, is actually something you can find on the internet. It's something called the Earth Impact Database, which is all the impacts we know about their size and time that they happen. And if you look at it, it turns out there is a little bit of evidence that it happens on a periodic basis of about 30 million years. Now, I'm not promising you this is right, but if it is right, we know what that dark matter disk should look like. And if we know what that dark matter disk should look like, we can test it with the Gaia satellite data that I told you about. And this is just me with someone actually looking at this amazing layer. And if you ever have the chance to see it, you should go, in no small part because it's always in really beautiful places. I've seen it, this is in Spain, where you can see this KT extinction layer. I've also seen it in Denmark. And it's, as I said, it's all around the globe, although it's only well-preserved in some places at this point. But it's really amazing if you think about it. There's this history buried in our planet. You can, if you look closely enough, you can look at that rock and see evidence of an extinction that happened 66 million years ago. And from looking at it in detail, you can actually learn that it was a big giant rock that hit the earth that caused it. And I didn't say this, but that big giant rock was really big. It was about 10 to 15 kilometers big, maybe the size of a city like New Delhi, coming and hitting the earth at 30 kilometers a second. So that, that would be a big dramatic impact, and that explains why an extinction could happen. We don't know in detail why it happened, but it would create many disaster scenarios. In fact, I like to think every disaster scenario but a zombie apocalypse. I mean, it would create earthquakes, it would create tsunamis, it would create global warming, it would create acid rain, it created fires, basically any disaster that could happen if you have something that big hit the earth could happen, and probably did. And that was a mere 66 million years ago. After which time, a lot of things went extinct, but then life gradually reemerged. And the small mammals that were buried underground grew into being the amazing life that we see today, in addition to, of course, the many other forms of life. So I don't, don't know if this dark disk is right. And as I said, the search of it is ongoing as we speak. But there are many, this is just one of many possible connections. And in the book I talk about other connections that we really know are there between what's going on in the solar system and the kind of things we see here on Earth and all these amazing ingredients that are essential to our lives. So I'd like to close with this silly slide. Um, as you can tell, it's from the Big Bang Theory. Now, it's really not done very well, but you see in the, in the right-hand side there, I'm actually sitting there. And, that, and that's because I have friends who write for the Big Bang Theory, and I was coming to visit them one day, and they said, why don't you be just an extra and just sit in the lunchroom? And apparently I'm a very good actor, because my uh, directions were to sit in the lunchroom and be very inconspicuous. And I was so inconspicuous that lots of people I know watched the show and had no idea I was there. <laughs> and I like to use this example, because I kind of think it explains a little bit why we do model building. If, if I tell you I'm there, even in this very bad lighting, you can see me. But if you didn't know that, you would not know. And I think that's what we're doing as scientists. We're kind of pointing to what you want to look for so you know it's there. And that's what I describe in my book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs. Thank you. So I think we're going to have a little discussion. I'm also happy to answer questions. Yeah, so we're going to go through there. So are there questions?
exciting, interesting things to ask Lisa. Um, if you could wait for the microphone to come to you, because you, as you can imagine, it's a big space, and we won't be able to hear you otherwise. So let's start with this gentleman over here in the grey jacket. Have we got them? Yeah. Can Actually, this person mic? right here. Can we ask you to stand up for a long time? Oh, which one? Um, right, right. Oh, over right. here. Okay, let's start over here, and then then this gentleman. Yeah. Oh, Hello. <clears throat> you said there's a particular periodicity about the impact of uh, this dark matter on us. So perhaps in a few years from now or a few million years from now, we might have a, another impact which might wipe out the things. So yes. how many, <coughs> uh, as per your uh, estimation or calculations, how many more years the JLF might continue? <laughs> yeah, so this is something a lot of people want to know. They get worried. Um, so I can tell you, I, t I talk a lot about the dangers, and in fact, it's really interesting, the National Academy of Sciences actually made a list of what impacts will happen over what period of years. The one I'm talking about, the one I'm talking about happens about every 30 million years, 32 million years, and just happened, we just passed through the disk a couple of million years ago. Um, the, the dinosaurs do match, it happened 66 million years ago, so if it happens every 32 million years, it would have been one of them. It's not like every one of them necessarily caused an extinction, even if there is something big that hits. It, or it might cause some local extinction, but not necessarily a major mass extinction over the entire globe. Um, so the one I'm talking about will happen every 30 million years. That's not to say that stuff won't hit the Earth that will affect us. It just won't be something that's bigger than a kilometer in size, most likely. Um, the thing is that the crater, that is, would be a common size. The object would be less than 10 kilometers. I mean, 10 kilometers is a very big object. So the things that are smaller that hit quite, quite reasonably often every, so the, we, we can like Tungus, we, we will notice some things that happen, and that can happen within a decade or 100 years. But, I, and, but that will be a much smaller object, which is very like, unlikely to actually hit a populated area. And that's why you often hit a, hear about things happening in Siberia or in the ocean, because you know they're bigger. So there could be small objects that hit, but that's not to say that we don't have a lot of things to worry about in the planet. It's just that it's not this. Yeah. At least on this count, you can sleep easy tonight. <laughs> um, how about this question, Dr. Randall? So um, this is a question about the Oort cloud. You mentioned that uh, every 30, 35 million years. If there is an influence from the dark energy disk that we have around in, in the Milky Way, that we would have an impact, right? So what else other than the Oort cloud, oh, sorry, other than the dark matter, could cause something to move out of the Oort cloud? That's a great question. So the question was, um, what aside from dark matter could cause something to go out of the Oort cloud? And that's actually one of the interesting questions that people do study. And so other stars, for example, will, could influence it if things get closer. And what happens is things do, the orbits do change because there's just a lot of stuff interacting. Um, some of it can just be random, and we don't even know that necessarily the object that hit came from the Oort cloud. We do know that there's a lot of stuff there and it can become unstable. But it is true also that it's hard to, that most of the other explanations for what could cause something to happen that often don't work. There are things that happen maybe every 75 or 100 million years. Um, like other passing stars, but it's really not clear. That's not proof that this is right, because as I said, we don't even know for sure that the object was a, a comet and not an asteroid, although there is some evidence that these big objects could be a little bit different. But you're absolutely right. That's a really good question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. The question is that uh, the question is uh, that uh, is dark, uh, is it possible that dark matter could be affecting other elements and that's a reason to it? Yeah, so I mean, as you probably know, I have worked on ideas about other dimensions of space. But I just want to say that as a theorist, you have to be super careful. In some ways, I've worked on it reluctantly because you sort of want to go through all the ordinary explanations before you say, let's do something super exotic for which we don't necessarily have additional evidence. 
In the case of extra dimensions, when I worked on it, I was looking for a solution to something called the hierarchy problem, which has to do with the masses of particles, which turns out is just really hard to solve in the context of just ordinary matter we know about or ordinary types of interactions. There's many possible candidates for dark matter. It's not that exotic. It's very easy to imagine matter that's stable that doesn't interact with light. The question is, where does it come from, and do we know what it is? So basically, yes, it's conceivable. It's associated with something exotic, like additional dimensions of space beyond the three we see. But there's no evidence for that yet, and there's no reason to think that. So yes, we can speculate, but it's very hard to know what would be the distinctive criteria by which we would tell that's even true. So as a scientist, if there's other more ordinary explanations and I can't even tell the difference observationally, it's not something I'm going to focus on for now. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one. Let's get the woman. Hello. Yeah, these are. Uh, uh, the, the concept of dark matter and dark energy is uh, not new as far as the Hindu mythology and the Hindu literature and Vedas goes. They say Could that. You hold your mic a little bit further away from your mouth. I can't understand. Sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, if you just hold the microphone a little bit. Lisa, the concept of dark matter and dark energy is not very new as far as the Hindu mythology and Hindu literature goes. In Vedas and in Bhagavad Gita, they say there are two types of energy, the gross energy and the subtle energy. The subtle energy is the unconscious energy, the, the soul and the spirit that leaves us after the death of an individual. So Lisa, my question is, is dark energy the invisible god that we can't see? Okay. Um. Since that was phrased as a yes or no question, I'm going to say no. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will expand a little bit. Um, um, so let me just say, there's, there's a whole chapter in my book about questions without answers. Um, so there's a lot of big questions that people have been asking for years. And of course we're going to ask them because they're fascinating. How did things start? What was there before things started? Whatever that means. You know, there's questions like that that people want to know the answers to. Um, the fact is, you know, as scientists, we try to focus on the things that we really can answer. But the other thing that that question gets at is, as human beings, we so want to tie ourselves into everything that's out there. You know, I think of us as scientists that are observing a universe. We're part of the universe. We have amazing connections to the universe. The carbon and other elements we're made of are essentially are essentially connected to it. The fact that we live on a planet is connected to dark matter, which allowed for the existence of a planet in the first place. So these connections are there, but we are not fundamental to it. And so we tend, now, as human beings, there's not that many categories. You know, either things had a beginning. They didn't have a beginning. Either there's energy or there's not energy. Either there's something or there's nothing. So we tend to think, oh, we've been thinking like this forever. But there's a really big difference between how science is approaching these questions and how people have been approaching it over the years. That's not to say that the concepts themselves are necessarily entirely new. But what we're saying about them and the precision with which we measure them, what they mean, are different. And they're less wrapped up with who we are. They're just statements about the universe. And on that topic, I'm going to ta take my liberty as uh, being on here on the stage with you. There is, around the world, this kind of retreat in certain quarters from rationalism, this kind of anti-science movement that's coming up. I mean, there was an Indian politician just recently who, who stated, and I'm sure you're all aware, that because nobody had seen a monkey become a man, that did evolution really happen? Was Darwin completely wrong? How do you, as a physicist, especially in theoretical physics, where these are very abstract concepts, and you've already mentioned that some people say, did, is dark matter real? Can, can we trust it? Um, how do you deal with issues like that? So, you know, it's interesting. I just had a discussion recently on a topic very similar to this. And the fact is, people have been suspicious about science for, for a long time. The thing that really has changed recently is that politicians have manipulated this to sort of try to get people on board. I mean, most good politicians realize that science has been pretty good for the eco their economy and for their country. And a lot of things work because of the scientific underpinning. 
But I think what's happened is because science has become more difficult to understand in part, um, people feel more alienated and they feel like they've, because it has influenced the world, they feel less personally con in control. So I don't think it's necessarily a question about understanding science so much as just what people think they can do with that information. And if people feel like it's other people using science to bad ends, like you see in movies most of the time, that's not gonna help us. So I think one of the reasons that I think it's important to share science is to say, look, this is something that is accessible to all of us. It's a real thing that applies to all of us. Um, but having said that, it's indeed a dangerous trend. Okay, any more questions? I want to take a question from a woman this time. Here we go, there's one in the front. <laughs> well, let's not be so obvious. <laughs> Thank you, my name is Melanie, and my question would be, would you say then that, uh, would you say then that global warming and climate change can be blamed by us on our stars, or rather the comets, rather than taking responsibility for what's uh, happening ourselves? Thank well, you. Well, it's, okay, so the question is, are there cosmological effects that can explain global warming? And actually, it is true that cosmological effects clearly influence the climate on our planet. After all, the seasons are a result of <laughs> the structure of our solar system. Um, that's not to say we're not responsible. Now, it's very hard in many ways to make precise predictions, but there definitely are correlations that can be measured, and there are patterns that can be seen, and there are changes that can be observed. And so, um, a lot of people do look at something like, in fact, one of the people that also identified a 32 million year cycle is someone who tries to identify it, um, climate change too with differences in what happens in, in our planet. The fact is, it's really hard to make those connections to explain what we see today. Um, it's worthwhile to ask those questions um, and certainly we want, to, you know, there are other cycles that I hadn't known about. There are cycles in the weather pattern having to do with, you know, little bits of shifts of our orbits and things like that. It's just the timing periods don't match. I mean, this is a, a very definitive period and it's not explainable by most of those things. But it's a really legitimate scientific question to look into what are the effects on climate um, and how well we can study them. Okay, here we go, there's a gentleman. This is the very last question. There's a man there, white, sorry, behind you. Yeah, yeah, you. If I remember properly, the pie you've uh, shown, if I properly remember the, the pie you've shown us, we only know 5%, we only see 5% of the, the thing. Uh, then 25% is dark matter, you said, and 70% is uh, dark energy. Any connection between dark matter and dark energy? Yeah, so this is terrible terminology, which I claim no responsibility for. <laughs> like I said, neither one of them should be called dark, because they really are transparent. They don't interact with light. And um, it really was branding. I mean, dark energy, the, it's not that it's energy. It's, it's actually associated with something even more exotic sounding, but it wouldn't have been a good label, which is negative pressure, which is why it can actually drive the expansion of the universe, as opposed to most gravity, which would slow down the expansion of the universe, most gravitational. So th they, um, they have similar names, but they're probably just independent things. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lisa. I hope you all enjoyed your <laughs> physics lesson. <laughs> Once again, a big round of applause for Lisa. It was such an interesting session, really. I really wanted to hear all of it, but in between I had some distractions. But thank you so very much for being here. Ang Angela, thank you so very much for introducing Lisa. Thank you.